Hi, everyone. Um, I've only got slides up here, so I'm going to be doing the awkward uh, sideways thing. So I'll try to make sure I talk this way and look that way, uh, but not at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about XArray and Dask, which are two of the libraries we use for the DataCube um, module that we're building at Geoscience Australia in collaboration with C CSIRO and NCI. The Uh, so my colleague Faye, before lunch, talked a lot about the, the organization structure and uh, what we're trying to do. I'm going to delve into the technical aspects. So uh, before I get started, um, there are some really good talks, which in hindsight, this slide should probably come at the end. Um, there's some great SitePy videos on this by the two creators of each of the products. Um, and I recommend checking them out for a, a bit more detail. So as we heard in Tennessee's talk, everyone loves NumPy. They're, it's really easy to do things. It's really easy to uh, get data, manipulate it, um, as long as it's the same type. Um, but it can be multiple dimensions. Uh, and everyone also loves pandas. And the advantage with a pandas data frame is that you can have multiple types. You have fancy indexing that you can pull out particular rows, um, and then f great support for data types like date time objects that you can do group by, you can, um, and then do computation on those groups or separately. So XRA, which was originally started as an open source project out of the Climate Corporation uh, and has now become part of Continuum, uh, is all about multi-dimensional arrays that are labeled uh, using pandas style labeling. So here we've got an example of creating an X-ray. Um, so inside, it's just an umpire array um, as the data itself. You then have data arrays to label what each of the axes are, and the axes are named. So uh, I've made an Excel looking thing. It's got columns called A, B, and C, rows one and two. I'm not very inventive when it comes to this. And then they've just got some numbers in there. And the good thing is you can use pandas style indexing uh, and just say, I want column A. And you maintain the row labels and it, with the object that you get back as a result, says that it's still column A. Um, and there's an example at the bottom of the pandas fancy indexing where you can go from A to B, and if that wasn't right next to it, it would do all the ones in between. And again, a lack of imagination on my part. Um, and so underneath, it's manipulating the, uh, the NumPy array and giving you a view and a slice, uh, only one of those things, um, into the underlying data. And so computation, it brings across all of the things that you can do in NumPy. So max, mean, standard, devi standard deviation, percentiles, all of the u-funks. Um, and in NumPy, where you'd say axis is 0, in X-Ray, you don't have to remember that 1 and 0 and which dimensions are which. You can just use the name of the dimension. And it keeps it a lot <coughs> cleaner. Um, and the good thing about that is, if you've ever had to deal with NumPy arrays and do maths on them, if you have a scalar, it broadcasts out to the full array. If you have a 2D array and a 3D array, you can work on them, and it works out based on order and size which one to scale out. Uh, with X-Array, it's a lot easier to understand because it matches name for name of the dimensions. So you can bring in another data set and it all fits very nicely together. So the big power of X-Array comes from, instead of writing a num, passing through a NumPy array, of reading directly from a NetCDF file. So um, anyone that's dealing with science data has probably come across. <laughs> it's all good. Um, 
So anyone that's... Um, <laughs> anyone that's dealt with uh, climate data, um, really large gridded data sets, especially if they're multidimensional over time or climate data that's over different parameters, it gets... it's it's a bit awkward to use. And the underlying netcdf library, that there's a Python version to open up the files, manipulate them, access, and write back out, it's, it's not the most Pythonic thing you can work with, um, but it does give you NumPy arrays. So net, I should have spell checked this better. Um, so netcdf and x-ray work really well together. Uh, by design. Um, so it's as simple as passing in, uh, in this case I'm using an opened app URL, so it's going to a, a thread server at the supercomputer at ANU and pulling back data. Um, and so it can tell me about the coordinates, so in this case I've just got a, an x, y and a time dimension to my data and I've got labels for each of those things. Um, and they've got their own data types and anyone Familiar with pandas? This will all seem familiar. Um, and then it's got my sizes. So the sizes of the dimensions are, are common across all the data arrays that live inside the data set, which is on the next slide. So this data set contains a couple of unimaginatively band names bands called band 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, um, and then a couple of extra things in there. So all of those arrays share the same, uh, so they share the same dimensions, they're the same size, um, and they share the same labels. So on that data set object, you can apply the same functions across all the variables at once. So across all the bands, uh, say selecting a certain set of time or a certain subset of the space, and you get back a data set that just contains that smaller amount. Uh, one of the other things that's important is that it contains all the metadata of the, the original file in an attributes dictionary, um, and every variable as well has its own set of uh, metadata. Um, and one of the good things about um, X-Array, uh, so the pandas plotting, instead of remembering the order of dimensions, um, in your data array, you can just use the dimension names. So here I'm selecting, so iCell is selecting by index, and cell, S-E-L, is selecting by label, and that can either be uh, an actual value or a slice. Um, and if you're selecting by label, for a single value, you can also say, give it a method of choose the nearest point to here, which is important if you've got floating point numbers like latitudes and longitudes, you're not gonna have the exact number. Um, so we're going from my data set, get me the data variable band 20, select the uh, index one time slice, and then plot it. And it comes built in with some nice matplotlib uh, settings that label your arrays, uh, label your plots, dimensions, um, scale, and include the time that even though we've, we've chosen a single point in time, it includes the label. So the other half of the story is Dask. And as we heard earlier in the day, Dask is a distributed task. And that task is, in this case, is getting a portion of an array. Um, so a Dask array wraps uh, a set of functions that say, this is how you retrieve portions of a essentially an NumPy array, and it does it in an, in, in, in an interface that matches the NumPy array interface. Uh, so down the bottom, we've got a Dask uh, com uh, computation graph, and the circles are the functions. And so as you read the top, to get any data from uh, a chunk, which we've defined in one and two, uh, one length of chunk one in one dimension, two in the other, uh, is get par a portion of the array. So it's, it's a fairly simple concept that instead of storing an array, you're storing a function to get an array. 
and the chunking uh, is sort of where the power comes from. Because you're then working on smaller parts, things that can actually fit into memory. If you're dealing with more data than you have in memory, you then have to manually iterate over it rather than just pointing Dask at the array and pulling stuff out. So this monstrous chart is, I've done a little bit of maths, uh, not even that much maths. I'm multiplying the array by the reverse of the array in one dimension. And so you can see it's sharing the, down the bottom, the very, the, the low level get this portion, get this portion, get this portion, get this portion. And then it's reusing those pieces as it does the multiplication. So all of these are small tasks that can get broken up and done by a scheduler. And the schedulers perform the task, return the answer, and it builds on the computation graph until you get all the way to the thing at the top that you requested. Um, and it shares the intermediate steps. And it gets powerful because without doing anything, by default, you get a threaded scheduler that works uh, using all the cores in your machine. So you get an instant speed up of array maths. It gets broken up um, very nicely. It knows w which parts need what. Um, there's other options to use a process pool. If you've got something like the NetCDF library, which is what X-Ray uses under the hood uh, to read the data, it's got some problems with the C library, so it can only open one file at a time per process. It, you get a, can get a speed up there if you're OK with the hit of uh, transferring data across processes. Uh, the cool thing, which I'm not going to talk too much about is distributed, which takes the, the DAS scheduler model and spreads it across a cluster of computers that each run workers that get given the jobs by the scheduler. Uh, so the great thing about Dask and X-Ray is that X-Ray has got Dask built into it just by passing uh, the chunks parameter to say, when you pull out data, pull out 500 by 500 by five pixels at a time. And that works, that's sort of your building block of your computation. Um, and it works just the same way as the rest of, as a normal X-ray object backed with uh, NumPy. Uh, the great thing is it doesn't actually read any data then. It's all lazy evaluated. So it happens straight away. It just needs to know about the dimensions and the labels, the, the contents of the data uh, remain on disk, so it's really good for scientists when you want to get something, play with it, do a series of computation on it. Uh, not yet. Um, a series of computation and then spit out the answer or just query parts of it. When you do the querying of a small part of the array, say you've, you're picking a time slice and you want to print it out, uh, plot it, that's when it works out all the things it needs to do just to get those chunks it follows back the computation tree and will only read the smallest amount of data it can, rounding up to the nearest chunk. Uh, and so you can do that until to test. And then once that's done and you're ready to process your entire huge archive of data, you can throw it at a scheduler and then let it just sit there and using all of your cores process the entire thing. And because it's only doing a small amount of time, a small amount of processing at each time, it can all fit into memory for a job that wouldn't normally. Uh, so we use this in the data cube. And I've just realized I've got the wrong slides up. Um, so as we heard earlier, it's a collaboration between Geoscience, uh, NCI, and CSIRO. And so here is a map of Melbourne. And the blue lines that you can't really see that well so this is an outline of uh, a scene. So in Landsat, satellite processing follows the same path, give or take a bit. And as it flies overhead, it chops up the data um, into a scene. And that's what generally gets processed by downstream by USGS um, and GA as sort of a, a unit of data. Uh, it's got overlaps as well. Um, both 
as it goes along in the path, and the row, like uh, the rows overlap. So you can see in between here, you've got an overlap. So this means you don't have nice gridded data, which is fully populated in the the uh, time dimension. Um, in fact, it's about 30 sec. Uh, I'm not going to say that because I don't really remember. Um, there's not a lot of time between from scene to scene. Um, so, but as we heard earlier, it's a 16 day cycle to get back to that same scene. So it's a, it feels like it's gridded data, but when you look at it, it's just a slither of data going around and around the world. And here's the marketing slide that they used to sell the project. Uh, so here we've got the slices and they don't really line up. Um, in space or in time. So we drill through them, uh, tile everything up, and then for a particular tile, it's, you've got a 3D data set that you can work with a lot easier. Uh, again, I apologize. I went and changed, somewhere I have slides that don't, don't have this. Um, So at the very, very top, uh, you can see we're making a data cube object, giving it a config, and then we're saying loading, load some data, uh, giving it a bounding box in space and time, and the same sort of style here, uh, we're giving it chunks to use. And so internally it'll create an X array and a dask array that knows about the particular files it gets. So Instead of before, we saw it opening a file, and X-Ray allows you to um, open many files at once if you have like a common file name path. Um, we use a database in the back end to look up where all the Landsat data is and all the other satellite data we store, uh, return the results, and populate it that way. So you don't, you just talk about a, which product you want, and um, there's other ways to define uh, what you want based on satellite type and properties. Um, and then you get back an X-ray, and we're hoping this is a much easier way to work with data than having a directory full of uh, scenes that don't line up, um, that are in slightly different projections, that it's, it's a lot of work to bring it together. We're hoping the X-ray that you get returned is an efficient way to work. Um, so in the request I just did, it was 54 gigs worth of data. But because I was using Dask, it's still on disk. I've just got an object that tells me how to get the data when I need it. Um, so anyone that's in remote sensing knows, or in ecology, knows about the NDVI, which is an index of vegetation. Um, and you compare the red band and the near-infrared band of uh, your satellite image. And the ratio gives you a good idea about the level of vegetation for that, that pixel. Um, so the great thing is you can just say, get the near infrared X-ray, um, data array, and the red one, and do some basic maths. Uh, this just is near infrared over here as well. And it spits you back an X-ray containing everything. Um, lazy loaded. You can then go get me the mean across time, as you would with NumPy, um, with a little bit of work. And then here we see it's internally it's an X-ray. When you actually want to get the data, you can do anything that'll cast it to the number. Um, so if you use it as an array and try to get the value and calculate it with it, it'll fetch the data. Otherwise, you can ex explicitly say load, and it'll process the computation graph made by doing the mean operation and then work out what it needs to get to do the mean operation, which is doing the, the plus and the minus and the divide, all the way back to here's the function to pull out the data. Um, so right now, the, the data cube, uh, we've got a database set up on NCI, uh, running it for internal um, partners to the project. So a lot of CSIRO and partner organizations are using it. Um, or you can build your own. Uh, so it's all open source. 
uh, Postgres with SQS, SQL Alchemy, um, and a couple of other Python tools that I think a lot of people would be familiar with, uh, if you have your own set of data. So we've had people around the world um, try this. So the, a couple of space agencies have been trying to get their own data and seeing how it's being used. And it seems to be going OK. Um, so what we really want to be able to do is make it so that anyone running Python on their laptop or PC anywhere can use the data set that we've got. And the way we're going to do that is exposing the database just through a, a RESTful API and allow access to the data instead of directly accessing the files going through the Threads Opened App Server, which we saw in the first example, uh, which means you can access any particular piece of space and time of the data you want with just a query um, and not have to download many, many files. It'll just pull down what you want. Um, and I don't know when this is happening, but it's sort of next on the schedule. Uh, thanks. Uh, any questions? Other questions? Yes, already. Uh, thank you very much. If I could quickly ask you two questions. One is you chose a chunk size. Does it make much difference, your choice of chunk size, and can it choose it for you, perhaps, if it makes a difference on performance? Um, and if I've got small data where it's a gigabyte data set and it doesn't matter, does that give you much of a performance hit? Should I just use sort of Dask Anywhere and scale up as I need it, or is it going to sort of make it slow for small things? Uh, so with chunk size first, uh, if you have too many chunks, uh, internally Dask uses a dictionary object. Um, if you do sort of the, the basic maths of how many chunks you're going to get, performance gets really bad uh, at a certain point. The number of just the, the dictionary operations it has to do to find the dependencies starts to get a bit ridiculous. Um, on the other hand, having a chunk, like you also want chunks that if the underlying thing is reading data, you don't want to read data that's too small uh, because you'll get, so say with the Luster file system at NCI, um, if you're doing it in a, in a supercomputer application, if you're reading anything less than a meg, you're really wasting uh, time that it's, it's reading a meg by default anyway, and you're just reading a smaller part doesn't work so well. Um, Picking the chunk size is also tricky because if you're using NetCDF underneath, it's got an internal chunk um, size the way, it, if you've got compression turned on, the way it stores data. So in terms of can it guess something for you, it's, it could do it, but it would probably do it badly. And I, I wouldn't have a good handle on uh, sort of a heuristic to find out what works. Uh, and I've forgotten the second part of your question. Uh, you, is it much for performance hit if it's just a tiny data set where it's all got a fitting memory anyway? Uh, so you've got to look at how efficient, if, how many cores you've got, um, and whether that works in spreading it across eight cores if you've got an eight core machine. Are you I.O. bound or are you CPU bound? So that's, it could be. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, just wondering if this data works well for sparse um, matrices at all. If you can, if you can use um, sparse data sets under the hood. In terms of you've 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 got image data obviously, which is quite dense. If we've got text data, which is quite sparse dictionary, is is there any benefit of using this sort of system for large sparse data sets? Uh, it, it could be. So I. I'm not sure if X-Array would be a good fit. Um, it, it might be. I haven't really thought about the problem. Um, Dask has a couple of other collection types. Uh, so it's also got a, data, a Pandas data frame version and a bag object that works really well with iterators. So probably, depending on the dimensionality of your data, using a Dask data frame um, gives you all the power of a Pandas data frame uh, with the, the ability to uh, 
have that computation tree. Thanks. Sorry, one other question. Um, how would you say this compares to Spark and in the distributed sense? I'm not very familiar with Spark. Um, so Okay, no worries, thanks. Uh, I would say that. Um, so you mentioned multiprocessing, and I came a while ago from a background uh, where I was using um, ScalarPack, which is based on MPI. And ScalarPack uses this idea of block cyclic um, layouts for data. And I was just wondering um, how well Dask works with specifically with MPI. Or have, have there been any projects that have used both that and, uh, say, MPI for Pi? Uh, not that, that I've seen. Um, so the distributed library I talked about before is a sort of branching off um, the work of Dask, which does the cluster implementation. Um, and it doesn't use MPI, it just uses uh, HTTP comms and uh, pickling up your data and your functions to get processed remotely. Um, so I, I don't know anything about the, um, the, the thing you were talking about. Um, but I would say that there's a talk on Sunday uh, by Nathan from Bureau of Meteorology that will include some Dask and distributed as well. So I recommend going to see that. I will be. Okay, last question. Um, you say XArray uses NetCDF. Um, do you know if it's got plans to use any other formats like GRIB or um, HDF5? Uh, so HDF5, I think, because that's uh, NetCDF is a type of HDF, I believe. Well, I could be completely wrong. Uh, NetCDF3 was its own thing. NetCDF4 sits on top of HDF5, so it's going to be So if the people that didn't hear that, NetCDF3 was its own thing. NetCDF4 is a type of HDF5. I think, cool. Um, so HDF, yes. Uh, there is, they are extending the API of X-Ray to be able to add custom backends. Um, and we're not, uh, so in this case, we don't actually use the NetCDF library. We go through Raster.io, which wraps GDAL, which then wraps the NetCDF library. Um, so the way we get data in is we point Raster.io at it and say, read this JPEG 2000, read this GeoTIFF. Um, and then we, when we write it out, we write it as NetCDF, but there's nothing stopping you pointing it at any data set and just doing the, the reprojection on the fly if you need to. Um, but I, so, sorry, that, that was answering the question from a data queue point of view. Um, but X-Ray, yeah, the, there's alternate backends. Um, I don't know if they've gotten very far with the grid one, but it could fit in. Cool. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. And here is your official speaker's mug, um, if you would uh, thank Andrew again. Thanks.